which I'm here with Kyle Bass, the founder and CIO of Heyman Capital. Kyle, the amazing thing about global investing is that you can do it from anywhere and you can talk about it from anywhere, which is why we're here uh, as your guests here in Central Texas. Nice to see you. Good to see you too, Eric. So we're used to talking to Kyle Bass about China. We've been doing that for the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. But a few weeks ago, you wrote an op-ed, you published an op-ed in Bloomberg View of all places, titled, The IMF Needs to Stop Torturing Greece. Mm -hmm. And you acknowledged that your position effectively long Greece, mm -hmm. looking for things to improve. Why Greece? Why now? Why you? <laughs> why me? I always wonder that one, but I can answer the other two. Um, you, look, Greece has gone through uh, essentially a Great Depression, right? We've had peak to trough GDP decline of almost 30%. Uh, the Greek people, the Greek government has suffered mightily uh, over the last eight years because they don't have a currency of their own uh, to make the, the adjustments that needed to be made to their economy post uh, financial crisis and post European banking crisis. And so Greece has been at the mercy of, of basically the Troika and, and truthfully just, you know, the European Union and the IMF together lent a lot of money to Greece to keep the European Union together. And uh, now uh, basically what I was saying was I think the IMF is being entirely too punitive. Uh, with their um, with their requirements or demands on Greece, and and the good news is that they ended up coming to a uh, to a, a much better mutual conclusion um, post uh, the writing of our piece. So why now? Um, I think, uh, it, and the reason I ask that is because some people would look at the Greek trade and say it's already played out pretty nicely for those people who are in Greek government bonds. Mm. They've been rallying, they're up 16% already this year. Right, so there's a difference between Greek government bonds and the banks and, and the equities of Greece. So when you look at, for instance, the banks uh, collectively only have about $10 billion of market cap. Uh, when you look at bank market cap to GDP, it's, it's the lowest in the world. And so when you think about an economy that, that's just now starting to show green shoots everywhere, whether it's tourism, uh, new vehicle registrations, GDP, primary deficit, no matter how you look at the macro indicators of a country, for the first time in eight years, the macro indicators are just starting to start flashing green. And um, therefore, I think you also have an interesting political situation in Greece where I think there's going to be a handoff uh, from, the, uh, from the current Syriza government to kind of a, a more, a slightly center-right, but very economically uh, independent new leadership in the next, call it, 18 months. And so I think you ask why now, and I think you're starting to see green shoots, you're starting to see uh, the banks do the right things finally uh, in Greece, and you're about to have new leadership. So, uh, you know, I think that, I think you're going to see, and if you remember Argentina, uh, as Kirshner was going to hand off, uh, hand the reins over to someone that was much more, uh, let's say, focused on business and economics uh, than being a kleptocrat, I think you're going to see something, again, slightly similar in Greece, where you have leadership today that might not be the right leadership and the, the government in waiting, I believe, and I think you know, Mr. Mitsotakis, I think you're going to see something great happen to Greece in the next kind of two years. Hand the reins makes it sound a lot more friendly than it typically is. Uh -huh, true. Um, so you would liken the opportunity in Greece to what you enjoyed and others enjoyed in Argentina with the transfer of power from the Kirshners to Macri? I, I would. I, w I mean, clearly, you, there isn't a great parallel to draw other than I think that foreign direct investment into, uh, inward FDI to Greece is not really happening uh, on a large scale uh, because the political situation, I think, is what it is. I think global investors will need uh, more economically friendly leadership uh, to take over before you see true privatizations happen in Greece. And I think you'll see some marquee privatizations happen over the next couple of years. How much money do you think you can make in Greece on an unlevered basis? <laughs> No, really, that's what people need to understand. When you yeah. spot opportunity, you're talking about it in I terms think, of what? Look, when you look, at the, when you look at the Greek banks, they traded a third of book value. Uh, and even when you look at, at some of the countries of Europe that ended up also going through painful restructurings like Portugal, Spain, Ireland, um, you know, these, these things traded down to, you know, um, 50, 60 percent of book, and now many of them trade north of, of book value. So when you get something where they are today, almost 25 percent of book value, I think you have uh, the opportunity to make several turns on your money unlevered in the next few years if, if things work as planned. 
Now, the other question I have is, why make this case now? By arguing against austerity, you're really just kind of helping the series of government, are you not? So I'm not arguing actually against austerity. I think that Greece has hit the fiscal targets that they've been asked to hit by, by their creditors, essentially. And some of those targets were designed, uh, look, we'll, we don't want to get deep into the minutia, but basically what they've done to create the primary surplus was basically uh, agree to an economic contraction. And I think a new government might be able to negotiate some of those primary surplus points for spending if they're willing to kind of adhere to a more strict framework in the rest of the economy and also where they'll spend the money. Right? They're not just going to give it to the people in a Christmas bonus, which we saw happen last year, which generated like less than two points of favorable uh, um, polling for the current government. That's just burning money, right? We need to structurally reform Greece. And there are a few things that are going on there. Like in Greece, there are two things that they do for sport that aren't done here. One's tax evasion <laughs> and one is selectively defaulting on your loans. Well, those two things I think are about to change for a number of different kind of uh, organizational reasons. So there are all kinds of behind the scenes, there are all kinds of structural change going on that makes it interesting to us. Given that new democracy is polling so far ahead of Syriza, mm. the minute Tsipras, Prime Minister Tsipras calls an election, what happens to Greek financial markets? Um, well, um, yeah, if that, if that were to happen in a surprise, which we don't think is going to happen anytime really soon, but sometime next year, I guess, in the time continuum of markets next year is an eternity. Uh, but sometime in the next 12 months, you'll see, we think you'll see elections called, and the market will, will I think, will go up 20, 30 percent. In a single day? In a week, let's just say, pretty, pretty close to immediate. There'll be an immediate revaluation. Yes. Yes. Of both the, stocks, in general, bank stocks, it would sound in all, particular. All the Greek market in general. Yeah. And Greek credit as well, sovereign credit. Sure. We need to touch on China. Are you still as, I hate to call you a China bear because your view on China is very specific. Do you still believe as strongly as you've ever believed that the Chinese banking system is going to suffer a crisis? Sure. I mean, you, again, it's simple. You just can't grow a banking system you know, a thousand percent in 10 years and not have a, a loss cycle. Again, I even the IMF in their most recent Article 4 review called China's credit buildup dangerous and said in all of the instances that they've studied in a build credit buildups in the manner in which China's built theirs, almost every single time there's been a banking crisis. And so uh, you're already seeing warning signs from someone that's not very good at calling uh, um, negative events. Uh, and so it's, they're just going to have a loss cycle. It's not the end of the world for China, but it's, it's happening right now. And um, the government just needs to hold on to get through this National Party Congress that's happening here in the next month or so. Uh, mm -hmm. And then post the NPC, I think you start to see real financial reforms happen. We're going to see that after October the 18th when they hold the National Party Congress. Mm -hmm. You're well, certain. I'm not certain. What, I, what I'm telling you is, is my, my guess is their, their laser-like focus on exchange rates and dealing with uh, the Trump administration is going to be relaxed a bit once Z consolidates his power. You know, their electoral cycle is a little different than ours, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Their NPCs happen every five years. Um, you know, Xi, this is the end of his first term. He's going to solidify a second term. He's going to reconstitute the Standing Committee of the Politburo. And we think that he has consolidated power. He's quickly becoming the most powerful Chinese ruler since Mao. And uh, the question is, will he have a third term? And so once this consolidation of power is over and the NPC is finished, I think you're going to see more natural economic forces acting on their banking system. Those who have been listening to the case that you've been making since the middle of 2015 might ask themselves or might ask you, why isn't the trade working yet? Well, so since the middle of 15, it worked beautifully. It did work until, for a while, uh, yes, that's December true. December of last year. You know, this year, the, the Chinese currency has dramatically appreciated versus the dollar. And I think that um, uh, pl there have been many political reasons why. Uh, the Chinese wanting to save face, the Chinese not wanting to admit that their system is as, as weak as it is. And truthfully, the, the Chinese kind of uh, resurgence globally, both economically and militarily, is rooted in their belief that they're such a strong economic power and that they are no longer a backwater uh, as far as the developed world's concerned. And so it's kind of that whole argument is built on uh, a foundation of sand. 
And as they restructure their banks and their economy, they will prove to be a lot weaker than they are. How painful has that appreciation of the yuan been for you? It's, I mean, it's, it's been terrible this year, right? I mean, but in the, in the, again, you think about the time continuums of these big global macro events. Unfortunately, they, it doesn't fit into a nice envelope that works every month, every quarter, every year. And so you just have to, if, if, if you have to stick with it as long as you can. And in this, in this environment, I think in the next, uh, call it nine months from October, you'll see the rubber hit the road. Nine months. And now, if you need to, can you stick with it for longer than that? For sure. Your pa capital is patient enough? Well, a lot of it's my capital, so. Yeah. <laughs> Infinitely patient, uh, I guess. I wouldn't say infinite, but I would say that, that uh, hopefully we have a, we have a long, time, uh, long time ahead, yeah. And are you as all in on China with your money and others as you had been before, or have you taken any of it on the table, uh, taken any of it off the table, if you will? Well, look, we, we uh, attenuate our positions based upon our views of the politics. And um, uh, I would say today we're as strong as we've ever been. Uh, but it may be in the last few months or quarters we hadn't been. Uh, but we, we've always had a position on, right? So uh, it depends. We do move it around a little bit based upon our views of the politics, but where we are today is, is almost full strength. Kyle, another situation I know you've done some work on is Puerto Rico. Are you positioned in Puerto Rico no. at all? No. no. So help me understand why. Why is it that you looked at Puerto Rico and didn't find anything attractive, whereas so many other hedge funds did, and now they're kind of stuck. Yeah, so uh, you and I have talked about this offline. Uh, Puerto Rico is just a simple math 101 question, the way that, the way that we see it at our firm. Uh, Puerto Rico has $70 billion worth of on-balance sheet debts. They have about $30 billion of off-balance sheet unfunded pension liabilities that are acute. So they have $100 billion worth of debt. There's only three and a half million people in Puerto Rico. There are only 1.4 million of them have a job. And about 60, 70% of those people work for the government. So- A situation th made vastly worse by Hurricane Maria. Yeah, and look, the hurricane is a, is a tragedy. It's a disaster. And, and I think that the Trump administration and, and the United States should be doing everything we can do to help them. This is, these are two different questions. One is, should we help with the hurricane? Absolutely, we should do everything possible. But on the debt question, you have to, I just think you have to be a little crazy to think that $100 billion worth of debt or even $70 billion of on-balance sheet debt is worth anything with 1.4 million workers in an economy like Puerto Rico's. So if you were holding Puerto Rican debt today, whether it's the general obligation bonds, whether it's the PREPA bonds, whether it's the COFINA bonds, what would you be marking them down to? Well, I mean, they didn't they trade down? Uh, I just tra they traded back, into the 30s. I just got back from Greece, as you know. Uh, so I, I heard last week that they traded, you know, materially lower, 20 percent lower in a day or so. Um, I mean, I, I think and even they, lower since the president talked about wiping out Puerto Rican debt. Yeah, when you look at sovereigns and you look at the history of sovereign defaults, you know, recoveries in wipeouts are 10 to 20 cents on the dollar. That's what I think people are going to end up with. 10 it's to 20 simple. cents on the dollar in Puerto Rico. Yeah. I mean, again, and that's each, because each situation is a little different, but just in the big picture, there's $70 billion worth of debt. There's 1.4 million people that work. Like we, get, we understand these things. Sovereigns are all asset heavy, but you're not going to have a sovereign uh, sell all of its assets to pay external creditors. They're going to get as many hedge funds as there as they can, and then they're going to default. That's what they're doing. Does it make any sense to you that that many hedge funds piled into Puerto Rican debt? It does because there are a lot of these special situation funds, many of them you know, I know pretty well, uh, that love uh, working on things like this. And they're the, they're the people that, that, are the, that hold sovereigns hostage. And they have holdout positions. And they take, drag people through the courts. And they're wise guys. But in the end, like, what's the true value? You know, I saw, I saw a Bloomberg piece that day uh, that Trump spoke that said, you know, he's calling into question $3.8 trillion muni market. No, he's not. He's being pragmatic here and saying they can't repay this debt. We're going to have to wipe it out. And he's not calling the whole muni market out because it doesn't, it doesn't have the same financial characteristics. So I think it's going to be getting wiped out. Kyle, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Hmm. <laughs> You're hitting me with a bunch of hard questions here. <laughs> um, you know, Bitcoin, early on, I summarily dismissed Bitcoin, and, uh, and I shouldn't have. Um, I didn't understand, truthfully, I don't understand uh, the depth of the, the algorithms, the technology, and the, the, the fundamental foundation of Bitcoin I didn't understand. I spent a lot of time trying to understand it in the last, call it six months. And I believe that, that the digital asset class of cryptocurrency is a real asset class. 
But in terms of kind of how the world views digital currencies, you know, we, we talk, when you look at, at global cash positions today, given global QE, they're now north of 110% of global GDP. So we're talking about almost $100 trillion worth of cash in the world. That has never happened before in world history. And so when I think about uh, inflation, you're starting to see wages move. You're starting to see the price of all goods and services move. The thing that's been really deflationary in the globe has been technology. It's been a, a very positive deflationary force. And I think that's kind of, pl that's played out. The technological deflation has played out. So now I think you're going to start to see inflation and wages move. And this gets into cryptocurrency. The collective value of cryptocurrency is a little over $100 billion today. Right? Global M2, global cash, it's like $80 trillion, $100 trillion. So what's $100 billion? You know, the question is, what's it worth? And as a store value, medium exchange, and other currency, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any true institutional investor has any money in Bitcoin. I know some have a little bit. Uh, you know, they have nominal amounts invested. But I think it will be an asset class that will work over time. I'm not sure how to value it yet. I really have no idea. Do you own it? Uh, I don't. No Bitcoin, no Ether? I don't. Are I mean, you tempted? I, I, I say I wish I did. But I think there's well, a digital. Well, because you could have bought a lot lower. I think there's a digital gold rush that's gone on. I think a whole bunch of people are going to lose a lot of money, right? That, these ICOs, you're going to see a bunch of them go completely broke. There are, a bunch of them are frauds, and um, that's going to be problematic for all the people that just rushed in. Uh, and and so I I feel like it's a bit of a mania at the moment. But I think in the long term, it's a viable asset class. So at what point do you get in? Well, I'll let you know when I do. <laughs> Kyle, before we run out of time, I know that there's something you wanted to say because you told me you did in connection with the shooting in Vegas mm. and guns and the whole debate over gun registration, gun regulation. Tell me what it is you want to say. Yeah, I just, you know, first of all, the, the tragedy that happened in Las Vegas is something that, that I think we can all uh, really empathize with uh, with the victims and and uh, it's one of the it's the worst you know shooting in in U.S. history mass shooting in U.S. history and for those people were sad and 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 as we get into this debate there really shouldn't be a debate going on you know as someone who meaning what I I just think as someone who collects guns and you think about the you're talking about yourself myself yeah my, how many guns do you own uh, I don't know truthfully I don't dozens know. it dozens yeah my son and I you know are ver we're very close to the military and military veterans and people that um, have fought fought for us fought for our freedoms and and uh, some have paid the ultimate price and others have come back and and we try to help integrate them into society those people are friends of ours and my son and I have this you know we we have this place here that we enjoy and it, it just when I think about this debate, should guns be registered? Absolutely. Should people be able to sell a gun from one to another without uh, recording the buyer and the seller? Should every gun have a serial number and be registered with the federal government and local authorities? I think this is a no-brainer. That's just a pragmatist. The NRA fights that tooth and nail. You know, the, the easy give in this situation is, oh yeah, well, we'll eliminate bump stocks. Well, the bump stock is the thing that turned the semi-automatic gun into the automatic gun. Well, that's easy because I, I know a lot of gun owners. I don't know anyone that has one. Okay, so that's kind of a that's kind of a throwaway. The real the real debate is we should start registering guns now. Truthfully, it, none of this would have stopped the shooting in in Vegas, right? Even in mental health exams, registration. This this guy could have passed all these tests in theory, from what I read. Um, so it wouldn't wouldn't help, wouldn't solve that situation. But I think I think that the Republicans need to. Uh, give here and really start just registering all the guns and also maybe maybe eliminating the ability of, of the general public to buy some crazy weapons that you can buy today. So forget about the Republicans for a moment. What do you say to those people who listen to the point that you just made and say, hang on a second, that's an infringement upon my basic rights as a U.S. citizen granted to me by the Constitution and constitutional amendments? Yeah, I mean, because now you're getting into the, the, let's say, where do you draw the line? Like, I guess I am. Is, is, your, is, your, is your right to bear arms your, the right for you and I to buy a battleship and put it here in this lake and have a gun that's 30 feet long that can shoot a projectile 50 miles? I mean, is that your right to bear arms? Or is your right to bear arms your right to have a shotgun and a deer rifle and do whatever you want to do on your property? But maybe you shouldn't have a gun that can be a machine gun unless you really go through all of the hoops with the government and mental health authorities. Or maybe you shouldn't have a gun that can take a plane down at the end of a runway. Um, you know, 
I, I, again, where do you draw that line? I'm not suggesting that I know where to draw that line. I know personally where I draw it, but I don't know where the country should draw it. Uh, I just think that you have this right to bear arms. And of course, I agree with that right. But I also think there's some commonsensical things that need to be done with the gun lobby uh, and gun registration and, and the way guns are sold back and forth to one another that could really help. Uh, again, it won't solve the whole problem, but it could really help our country. And I think it's something that's it's easy. This is something that should be easy. Like when you buy and sell a car, Everyone has a title, everyone has a registration, everyone registers their car sale with the local authorities. Why shouldn't you have to do that with a gun? Like, this is just easy, it's sensical.